London news agents. It's deeply regrettable if anyone has been speculating, betting on the election on the basis of inside information. But at the moment, we've got a, an investigation, a process going on, I think led by the Gambling Commission. Ask them, did you place a bet or did you not place a bet? The answer is binary. It's either yes or no. And if the answer is yes, sack them. Because that's the Gambling Commission's no, role and no, responsibility. No, he's... One candidate, Craig Williams, has admitted he did it and he's made a mistake. Why is he still standing? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's both a, a, a principal point and a practical point. Uh, that needs to be determined as to whether you actually had prior knowledge, because the whole point of this is whether you had knowledge of, uh, uh, of the data or not, which is what the uh, Gambling Commission are investigating. You heard it there. From minister after minister, there are principled and practical reasons why Rishi Sunak could not suspend those alleged gambling candidates in the middle of a campaign until the Gambling Commission had made its report final. Today, in seconds, all that changed. Yeah, as vault fasses go, it was sudden. Uh, Craig Williams and Laura Saunders now no longer have the support of the government, the Conservative Party as candidates. Whether they're still members of the Conservative Party, whether that's been suspended, the statement doesn't say. But something that has been plainly obvious for everyone for days, that they had to be suspended, has finally happened. Why has it taken Rishi Sunak so long to reach the obvious conclusion? Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And a little later, we will be talking you through the story of Julian Assange. You might have heard today that a deal was done. He has been released from prison. He's on his way to Australia. But we wonder if you know the story of how it all began. We do. We were there. We interviewed him back in 2010 on the day the WikiLeaks drop first happened. And for anyone who hasn't followed all the twists and turns of this story and has just joined it late in the day, we thought it might be helpful to tell you why he's still being considered both a criminal and a hero. Yeah, saint or sinner. I mean, maybe it's not that clear cut. Maybe the picture of Julian Assange is actually much more nuance. But we'll come to that in a moment. We've got to start, though, with the suspension or the disavowal or the disowning. I don't quite know what the right verb is. The withdrawing of support for these two Tory candidates, one of whom was the parliamentary private secretary to Rishi Sunak. Therefore, we had deep inside knowledge. Uh, and the other one uh, is the wife of the head director of campaigns for the Conservative Party. So presumably also might have known a thing or two about when the election was going to be called. Yeah, you're looking for the right verb. What we have been told is that both of them will no longer represent the Conservatives at the election. So for voters in Montgomeryshire and for voters in Bristol North West, that's Laura Saunders' seat, they will now be saying, well, hang on a second, if we want to vote Conservative, what do we do? Who do we go for? And I think this goes to the heart of the instability around the Sunak campaign over this one. As soon as Craig Williams announced, publicly said, he did take his words a flutter. As soon as that had been made clear, it would have been the work of an hour to say, you'll understand why I have to suspend you from this campaign. They would have had two weeks to parachute somebody else in, to put in place somebody who could have taken on the campaign, who might not have been encumbered with those allegations. But Rishi Sunak dithered. And he pretended it was something that had to go through a process. The Gambling Commission was a farrago. We all knew that. The Gambling Commission can decide what it wants. It has virtually nothing to do with the way Rishi Sunak is running his own party or the morality within it. That was always his decision. Look, you have someone who is accused of sexual assault within the Conservative Party. What do you do? You suspend that person while an investigation is carried out. And if the investigation finds there is no wrongdoing, they are readmitted back into the party. It is perfectly within the scope of the Conservative Party to do that. Instead of which, we've had two officials within the Conservative Party taking 
inverted commas, extended leave of absence, brackets, they're no longer part of the campaign. And we've got had two candidates who until today were still candidates mm. representing the Conservative Party. And the other aspect of this, we have spoken on the podcast about the decline in support for Rishi Sunak, the questioning of his judgment, the timing of the election, the way it's been conducted. Can you imagine what those ministers who've all now been feel? sent out? They must feel right bloody Charlies that they have been sent out. We've got to wait for the Gambling Commission. Wait what, for the Gambling what's your Commission. Talking point? To... Just talk about the Gambling, gambling Commission. Gambling, Just, commission if anyone asks you to talk about the Gambling Commission. commission. Yeah. And then suddenly. Rishi Sunak says, oh, no, we don't need to wait for the Gambling Commission. We're suspending them or we're disowning them or yeah. whatever. I mean, I'd say two things at this point. One is, if there are any further allegations of candidates involved in this sort of illicit gambling, then they automatically have to go, right? If we now find there are three or five more, presumably they also have to go because he's now set the precedent. Maybe that's why it took him so long. But it's also reminding me of somebody who Rishi Sunak would try everything in his bones to keep distance from, and that is Boris Johnson, of course. right? If you think back to the Pincher affair, Chris Pincher and the groping allegations, if you think back right to the original, let's say, Boris scandal, the Owen Paterson affair and the lobbying, what we saw from Boris Johnson time after time was this urge to support, to find his own loyalty to people that were in his party. He didn't want to throw them out. He didn't want to create a scene. He wanted everything to carry on. And there was, as we know, an operation, OPATS, to save Owen Paterson, even though it was a parliamentary standards committee that had found him guilty of lobbying. He could have taken the hit, disappeared from Parliament for 28 days, got on with it, but actually it became the first sign that Boris Johnson wasn't really in control of the politics of scandal then. And I think when Rishi Sunak stood on the steps and said, Haha, we've left all that behind, he really thought it. But now he's actually mirroring exactly the same kind of behaviour that we saw two prime ministers ago. Yeah, it's interesting. I wouldn't say it's the same behaviour because I think it comes from a different place. I think yeah. Boris was a knave and I think Rishi Sunak is a bit of a fool in terms of politics, just in terms of understanding the mechanism. I mean, we were saying days ago on the podcast, if you do not get ahead of the story... It will come and run you over and it's come and run him over. And, you know, we should talk about the timing of this, that Rishi Sunak has the last prime ministerial debate tomorrow night on BBC One with Michelle Hussein chairing it. And I suspect the Tory party suddenly, oh, God, yeah, if we don't if we don't do this today. Oh, yeah. God, tomorrow night's going to be awful. Yeah, we better we saw do that. this. Yeah, we saw we, that. Why everyone didn't saw it days and days yeah. ago. And for some reason, I don't know what it is. Rishi Sunak does not see the trajectory of these things, so is making tactical decisions, whereas the strategy should be, right, we clear this up as fast as possible. Presumably also because tomorrow night will be a live audience. And we know from having talked to Luke Trill and the more in common polling that we brought you yesterday, this is one of those scandals people understand. There are scandals people don't really understand to do yeah. with, you know, lobbying or to do with arms sales or to do with, you know, there's a lot of kind of grey areas. People understand an illicit bet because if it was in your power to get your bets right, who wouldn't? So look, kudos to Chris Mason from the BBC, because yes. the political editor, because he's been ahead of this story. And I was listening to him very attentively this morning where he says there is more to come and they expect more. Now, whether those names will come out, whether it will be as clear cut examples remains to be seen. And, you know, Chris wasn't saying that, but it's obviously the gap. Obviously, it's hard to get concrete information that you can then broadcast on. But the fact that he feels confident enough to go on the airwaves and say there is more to this means that maybe Rishi Sunak does not have a line drawn under this. Maybe there is more to come. And that will mean that for we've already up to nearly two weeks. It could go into the third and final week of campaigning that we are still talking about something that is utterly corrosive and deadly for the Conservative Party when the polls are already showing them lagging behind so badly. And I guess, you know, if you want to go back to how the public perceives this, there will be people saying, hang on a second, they've just had their campaign suspended, the support of the Conservative Party withdrawn, the policeman actually got arrested, right? Different kettle of fish. So are we back to one rule here and another rule there? 
and that is the worst bit about it all uh, for the Conservative Party. I was at a do last night. We were both there, and it was no. Tell me about it. Tell me about the do that you were at and how lovely it was. So I no well, no no. Go on. Just talk about your conversation. So I was speaking to someone closely involved with the Labour campaign, and of course they cannot believe their luck in terms of things going wrong, like the gambling thing, and how that has just you know been a gift from the gods. But this person was pointing out that if you are choosing the date of the election you have a huge inbuilt advantage over your opponents because you can busily buy up all the advertising space, hoardings or whatever you want, the best sites for the days before the election because you know it and the opposition parties don't know it until you declare it. So mm. you've got an inbuilt advantage where you buy the advertising, you buy the space, you do whatever yeah, you you've need You've chosen to do. the inside lane. You've chosen you, on the, the inside show. lane already, exactly. And they found that it seems that while sort of some Tory officials were going down the betting shop, they weren't doing any bookings. So <laughs> Labour got wind of what was happening. And apparently Labour have got all the best advertising hoarding sites for next week. They can't believe that they're luck. And the other thing that was said to me was that, look, the maximum that used to be able to be spent on a UK general election was around the 20 million mark. It's now been raised up to around 35 million. So Labour assumed that when the government announced that you could spend 35 million, the Conservatives had a war chest of 35 million. And so Labour were desperately fundraising to try to get that so that they could match Tory spending. Mm. Turns out the Tories set a ceiling of 35 million without ever having the 35 million themselves. So we are going to be in the, I think, unique position where the, the Labour Party will outspend the Conservatives yeah. in a general election. And again, they say, well, why, they, you know, people that are the professionals, the campaign professionals, not the politicians who are MPs or whatever, but the campaign professionals just can't understand how this could possibly have gone wrong in the Conservative Party. Yeah, just to take you inside that event um, a little bit further, it's probably worth saying it was a party at the American Embassy and it was entitled July the 4th. It was ahead of July the 4th and as the ambassador made clear obviously they weren't going to have a party on July the 4th because that's the same night as the general election and what was fascinating is that normally I think it's fair to say we see a lot of Labour MPs there don't we? We see a lot of both parties you know lot, lots of yeah. sort of cross party MPs this time very very few of the Labour MPs were there and I'm almost certain it was because they were terrified of anything that looked like you know, a Labour candidate with a glass of champagne ahead of July the 4th. Uh, I do know that Sue Gray herself was at the embassy in the morning. Yeah. She was there at 9.30 so in the Keir morning. Keir Starmer's chief of staff. And Keir Starmer's chief of staff, who is, you know, let's call it the powerhouse behind so much of what will be happening in government if Labour gets in. Uh, very good relationship with the US ambassador. And just interesting that she'd clearly chosen not to be right in the limelight, right in the sort of centre of, you know, a, a massive big garden party, but had her time alone earlier that day. And presumably an edict had come from somewhere high up in the party. You know, you, you're not going to this. I don't want anyone with champagne in their hands right yes, now. Yes, and the only senior Labour figure I saw at the party was David Lammy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. His but brief. that But that yeah. is his brief. Uh, on the Tory side, there were a number of cabinet ministers who were there, um, some with seats quite close to London, others with seats much further away. But I mean, you know, maybe when you think you're going down in flames, it's a last hurrah. It's lovely to stand on the terrace of Winfield House looking over Regent's Park towards central London. And maybe they thought, you know what? Yeah. <sighs> so grim, I might as well do it. Julian, welcome. It's been reported that WikiLeaks, your baby, has, um, in the last few years, has released more classified documents than the rest of the world's media combined. C can that possibly be true? Yeah, can it possibly be true? It's a worry, isn't it? That the rest of the world's media is doing such a bad job that a little group of activists is able to release more of that type of information than the rest of the world press combined. How, how does it work? That was Julian Assange giving a TED talk back in July 2010. And this was one of the first chances that we had to hear about Assange and about his company, WikiLeaks, and what it did. Because in that same month, WikiLeaks had just released some 91,000 documents, mostly secret US military reports pertaining 
to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it came at many of us, journalists at the time, as an absolute body blow. Somebody was, in a sense, doing our job in a much more wholesale, much more dynamic, dramatic and maybe illegal way. And this is where it gets complicated with Julian Assange, because on the one hand, anyone who got hold of a cache of documents like that would think, oh, my God, this is all my Christmases come at once. Gold because, dust. of course, you know, if you're a journalist, you want to find out what is hidden, what is locked away, what you know, what we are in the business of doing as journalists is trying to do what government doesn't want you to find out. On the other hand, when it is national security issues about maybe agents you've got in the field or the names of companies that are suppliers for small parts of your centrifuges which are being used for this or that weapon system, surely you need to then say, by publishing this, we're not compromising anyone's lives. And the, several of the newspapers around the world that worked with WikiLeaks over this were happy to try it and work with governments to say, look, we've got this stuff. Yeah. We don't tell us what we don't know. Tell us, tell us what is safe for us to put in the public domain. And Julian Assange became impatient with that whole process yeah. and dumped the whole lot onto the internet. And that's where it gets murky. Because is he then a champion for free speech, a journalist who's doing the job of investigative journalism? Or is he, as he described himself there in that TED talk, an activist who's managed to get more information than any group of journalists? And if he's an activist and doesn't feel bound by the same kind of rules of working within the national security apparatus, then it's a bit rogue. And it was back then that this sort of legend of Julian Assange started being created. And he became, in some circles, the guy who was not afraid to tell the truth, the guy who was going to expose what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And if I take you back to that time, 2010 was a really serious time for the UK and our relationship with what we then knew was a failing project in Iraq. I think the consensus by then had been it was a terrible idea, the invasion was wrong, it had been an illegal war, fought for the wrong reasons or maybe fought for some of the right reasons but with the wrong result and very little planning. We were in the middle of the Chilcot inquiry. We were looking at all the elements that went into trying to help us understand foreign policy under the Blair years, the Blair Brown years. And so when Julian Assange came out with this dump, extraordinary documents, the world kind of split down, I think, people who thought this was an incredibly important step to hold governments to account, and people who were saying, hang on a sec, you're not helping here, you're actually putting more people at risk. And in that latter camp, I think it's important to recognise there were human rights groups. There were people like Amnesty International. There was the Open Society Institute. They were writing to WikiLeaks to express their concerns and asking them to remove thousands of names from those Afghanistan war logs because they feared deadly ramifications for the people identified. And I think it's important to understand that he was uncompromising. He didn't filter. There was no filter. There was no redaction. It was everything that had happened and that created a whole series of of problems as you know as well as he would say solutions and i think the other thing we have to focus on because i mean look we were talking to one of our producers who kind of was saying this morning i have no idea how wikileaks started he's in his 20s you know this all started 15 years ago or whatever and you know it's perfectly possible but julian assange has led the most extraordinary life since then where he hid in the Ecuadorian embassy for years in London, uh, hoping to claim asylum in Ecuador. But the police had the place surrounded. And the mo moment he would have left the safety of the surrounds of the Ecuadorian embassy, which is kind of technically Ecuadorian territory, he would have been arrested and could have faced extradition to Sweden, where he was facing sexual assault charges. And that gets to the next chapter in the Julian Assange story, which again, is absolutely fascinating. It's to the 2016 election and the US authorities, Hillary Clinton, who had been Secretary of State to Barack Obama, is now running to be the president herself against Donald Trump. 
and suddenly there is another dump of emails this time from the person who was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff in that campaign, a guy called John Podesta. The timing of this cannot be overstated. This new tranche of emails came on the eve of the Democratic National Convention in 2016. I don't think any of us quite realised at that point how close the race between Clinton and Trump was. There were many in the Democratic Party back in July who quietly thought, we've got this, we've got this sewn up. And that tranche revealed what looked like machinations to push forward Hillary Clinton's campaign over Bernie Sanders' campaign. And the Democratic National Convention is the moment in American politics where you declare your nominee. So it was meant to be a coronation around Hillary Clinton as the chosen one for the Democrats. But you suddenly had all this information coming out which put real anger into the Bernie Sanders camp because they were starting to learn that maybe he hadn't been given an equal footing, he had been slightly blocked, he hadn't been seen as the chosen one. The system was pushing Hillary forward and keeping Bernie Sanders back, which created so much unrest. We were there yes. at the Democratic National Convention and you could feel the tension between the two candidates. I remember going over to the California delegation in the kind of conference centre in Philadelphia uh, to talk to them. And there were so many of them who were saying, I am going to vote for Donald Trump rather than vote for Hillary Clinton. Right. She's a bad woman. And there was such bad blood. But we need to talk about the source of all of this, because the source of those emails was where did WikiLeaks get them from? Da, da, da. There's only one place. Russia, Russia. Putin, Moscow. They wanted to do Hillary Clinton in. There was enormous bad blood between Hillary Clinton and Vladimir Putin. We're going to throw a name out at this point, which was a pseudonym called Guccifer. Guccifer was the project that was Russian interference into the 2016 election. If you've heard about Russian interference, this is where it is at work. So, again, you go back to the question that we started this podcast with. Saint or sinner? Yeah. Champion of free speech or agent of the Russian state right. doing some of their dirty work to interfere in the 2016 US election. A champion of free speech where he's revealing secrets that show that Americans behave badly in the Iraq war and some of which they did do. Or someone who just had no concern about the danger that he was exposing people to by just dumping all this information. And this became, in Hillary Clinton's mind, an absolutely key contributing factor in her eventual loss of the 2016 election. Let's just play you a clip of her pointing the finger remorselessly at WikiLeaks in that final debate of the 2016 presidential election when she was on stage with Donald Trump. You are uh, very clearly uh, quoting from WikiLeaks, and what's really important about WikiLeaks is that the Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. They have hacked American uh, websites, American accounts of private people, of institutions. Then they have given that information to WikiLeaks for the purpose of putting it on the internet. This has come from the highest levels of the Russian government, clearly from Putin himself, in an effort, as 17 of our intelligence agencies have confirmed, to influence our election. So I actually... So let's go back to the question we asked at the start of the podcast. Saint or sinner? Champion of free speech or agent for a foreign government? Arguably, there were a lot of things wrong with Hillary Clinton's presidential bid in 2016. But the interference of the Russian government with that dump of emails contributed. And Julian Assange indirectly helped Donald Trump to the presidency. So I know it's easy to frame Julian Assange as this whiter than white hero of journalism and free speech and exposing the truth and fearlessness. But I think it's a more complicated picture. So let's just bring you up to speed then. Three years after the DNC drop, we're now talking April 2019, 
Ecuador revokes his political asylum. They decide they've had enough. They don't want to play games anymore. And he is carried out of the embassy. And he's undergone quite an extraordinary transformation. I think there were even stories at the time. The Ecuadorian embassy is round the back of Harrods. And there were stories about him sort of growing a beard and dressing up and yeah. sort of goes and shopping at Harrods without anyone realising who he was, sort of slipping in and out. I don't know if those were ever confirmed. But it was a... It, as I say, he had this slightly mythological status, didn't he, for, for sort of many sort of freedom groups in London, in the UK. He became was the hero. The, the hero, the anti-hero. Anyway, in 2019, he's then carried out the embassy and he is then sentenced to 50 weeks in prison by a British court for skipping bail. He completes the sentence but remains in jail waiting for these extradition hearings and then Swedish prosecutors, again talking about the sexual assault, not the WikiLeaks drops, reopen their investigation seeking Assange's extradition to Sweden. And once in custody, he is then put into Belmarsh prison. And if you don't know what Belmarsh is, it is the top security prison where the most dangerous terrorists are kept. The people who have committed the worst crimes in British history are kept in Belmarsh. And Julian Assange, whatever you think of him, he was a white collar criminal. And yet he was there in Belmarsh in pretty tough conditions. And he was there for years until his release today. So he is heading down to Australia where he'll begin a new life. He has children uh, by his wife through a relationship that was forged, I want to say, in the embassy. Yeah. I mean, he has very little n knowledge of being a dad, except for these odd sort of moments of prison visits. And he has now got to make a stopover in the Mariana Islands on the way to Australia. Which is US territory. Which is US territory, where he will be served... Where he is up before a judge, and what we understand is he is going to plead guilty to one charge of espionage. So a plea deal has been done. Now, presumably, lawyers on both sides maybe could have reached a deal like this earlier. Yeah. But it means that, yes, Assange is going to accept that what he did was wrong because he is pleading guilty to a criminal offence of espionage, but which allows him to carry on with the rest of his life after this extraordinary chapter going back 14 years with the years in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, the years in Belmarsh top security prison. Would he be extradited to the US and go into a supermax prison? Or, or even possibly, face the death penalty. Or even face the death penalty in the US. Well, it's been resolved in a kind of slightly more... Uh, nuanced uh, way. Nuanced way. And I think sensible way. That doesn't mean he emerges as this hero mm. that is the kind of, you know, the uh, the superstar That's of the, the point, Stop isn't the it? War coalition. Everyone was at the extreme end. He was at the extreme end of failing to put any kind of guardrails around the stuff that he was leaking out, even if it was top security secrets. And I guess on the other side, the US was at the extreme end of saying, this man is a terrorist. Right. And somewhere in between the courts, the legal systems. I mean, Sweden has now by now dropped its rape charge because they say there's not enough evidence. And so there is this sort of rather gentle middle ground where a guy who is now, what, 15 years older than he was at the time of that first WikiLeaks drop, who has actually seen very few days of freedom in that time, is now going to start a new life in his old home country, originally Australian, with a brand new wife and the two children who he's never actually lived alongside with before. And that is the end for now of the Julian Assange story. I bet there's another chapter. Well, one little caveat. This is just an extra, an extra bit of juicy detail. In 1995, when he was a very young man, a teenager, he got arrested on charges of hacking. And they said, we won't send you to prison as long as you never, ever do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine how differently things might have turned out. Now, before we go, a word on geography, which has been an interesting feature of this campaign. <laughs> Rishi Sunak got his geography wrong memorably when he should have been on the Normandy beaches in France and instead was somewhere near an ITV studio. When he was in Wales, he also talked to Welsh men and women. Are you looking forward to the Euros? Forgetting that Wales weren't actually in 
uh, the Euro. So, yeah, geography challenging. Yeah. Carry on. Sorry a, to interrupt. A, a little parachute drop from one Tory party chairman, Richard Holden, whose uh-huh. seat uh, was being changed, you know, in the Durham. boundaries in Durham. And he decided that he'd look for a very local uh, alternative seat where he could stand. He found one 270 miles south in Essex in what I would have said looked like a very safe seat. Basildon Billericay, although now an insurgent reform party is looking like they might even take it. But anyway, What's Rich- happened? Richard Holden's had a bit of a bad morning. Why? Because they've just found out that he's been leafleting lots of yeah. people in his constituency in Essex, except they weren't his constituents and they weren't <laughs> in the right place. They've gone to neighbouring constituencies. So what, he's said. been sending leaflets? Yeah. Well, it's all Essex. It's all the same, isn't it? All the same. It's all, all the, the same, same in Essex. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. So maybe we now understand why... <laughs> They, they haven't been targeting quite the people that they were going after. They have been spending money leafleting people who cannot vote for the person on the leaflet that they have just received through their door. You see, on any other day, that yeah. could be quite a big story. Yeah. But now when you've it's got just gaffes of an epic nature, <laughs> like Fluttergate, yeah. Leaflet Gate just yeah. doesn't really cut it. Leaflet Gate from the Tory party chairman. chairman. He's the man who organises this stuff. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 